Good evening, friends. Are you having fun yet? Okay, okay, that's the right answer. Hey, uh, tonight um, I have the privilege of introducing a new study in the book of Mark. And uh, Mark is, and as you'll find out tonight, one of the most unique and action-packed of all the Gospels. And so uh, tonight I'm going to introduce it, and we'll uh, talk about the verses that were just read. Uh, let's jump in by asking, who was John Mark? Okay. Uh, many folks think he was one of the 12 disciples. He wasn't. Uh, he wasn't one of the 12. He was in his early teens during Christ's ministry. In fact, what we know is that John Mark grew up in Jerusalem, and um, his mom was probably Mary, Martha's sister. And they grew up in a large house. They had money. And uh, we also know the early church in Jerusalem met in the home that John Mark grew up in. So when he was a teenager, he met Christ, he heard Christ, and um, <clears throat> in fact, the upper room, uh, a lot of research suggests that the upper room was actually in the home uh, that John Mark grew up in. Obviously, during the Last Supper, no one was there but the disciples. Uh, but that's kind of John Mark's background. He was accompanied uh, with Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary trip but about halfway through the trip, for some reason, Mark got overwhelmed or, or, or just decided to leave. And so he abandoned that missionary trip with Paul and Barnabas. And when Paul went to go on the second ship, he said, I don't want John Mark to come. So when he said he didn't want John Mark to come, Barnabas, who was, some say, an uncle of John Mark, Barnabas said, well, I'm going to take John Mark, so Paul took Silas. And so the division of Paul and Barnabas ended up with two different mission trips. But, but the fun thing kind of is, um, later in their relationship, Paul and John Mark, their relationship was kind of restored. Second uh, Timothy 4.11, from prison, Paul requests that John Mark be brought to him. And uh, he says, only Luke is with me. Get John Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. And um, here's something else a lot of folks don't know about Mark. Mark was mentored. He was very close to the apostle Peter. In fact, uh, he was Peter's personal assistant. He was Peter's interpreter. And many believe that Mark is actually... Uh, most of Mark is the teachings of Peter, who obviously was with Christ. So we're jumping in tonight to what many believe is the most unique and action-packed of all four Gospels. So uh, let's jump in. What's unique about the book of Mark? Well, it was the first Gospel written. And um, John Mark, uh, the, the Gospel of Mark, is really kind of a, a reader's digest of Christ's life. There's no genealogy. It moves very quickly, goes from one event to another event as you'll see tonight. Also, the size of, of the Gospel of Mark. Matthew is 28 chapters. Luke is 24 chapters. John is 21. And Mark is 16. And in tonight's 15 verses, what we'll cover tonight in 15 verses, Matthew and Luke take four chapters, okay? So kind of get ready to hang on, and uh, we'll have some fun, okay? Um, the unique emphasis also, this might be helpful, of the four Gospels. There's a lot of overlap, but every Gospel has a unique theme. So Matthew and Luke focus on what Christ said. Christ's uh, teaching in Matthew, it focuses on what, what Christ preached, and uh, Luke focuses on Christ's parables. There's a longest, and that's kind of what's unique about Matthew and Luke. John focused on who Christ was. God, the Son, the Savior, the Redeemer. And of course, John was the last one written, so that's the focus of John. Mark focused on what Christ did. Again, his emphasis is on activity. In fact, uh, the word straight away, immediately, occur 40 
two times in the book of Mark. Straight away, immediately, Christ moves out. Uh, Mark then recorded many of Christ's sermons. There's more emphasis on what Christ did than just what he said. And he shows Jesus more than the other three as a servant. God the Son, who would be the Redeemer, came to serve common people. Not just rich, not just important, but all kinds of people, men, women, which back in time serving women in that day was not kind of really looked up to very much by those who were in charge. But that didn't matter to Christ. Men, women, rich, poor, it didn't matter who they were. It didn't matter what they did. And over the years, so often, I've seen folks who Satan likes to tell, you know, look at who you are, look at what you've done. And, you know, it doesn't matter whether we are red, brown, yellow, black, white, mauve, taupe, whatever color we are, okay, doesn't matter what our gender is. He loves us. He loves you. He loves me. I'm an older guy. I have long gray hair and a ponytail. I don't have a tongue. I talk funny. But he loves me. So whatever you walked in here tonight with, whatever mistakes you've made, remember that he loves you and he's precious and he wants to be precious to you because you are a value to him. Yeah. Jesus is servant. So the key thing, and then we're going to jump into the text, is discipleship. The thing about Mark is just do it. Don't just think about it. Don't just talk about it. Don't just collect good books about it. At one point, I had over 3,000, literally 3,000 volumes in my library. Five earned degrees, 3,000 volumes. Now, that's a guy who's very insecure, <laughs> okay? And, um, but, and there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with having degrees. Nothing wrong with reading lots of books. The bot bottom line is not how much we know. It's how much we live it, how much we show it. Kind of like they didn't have Nike back in Christ's time, but, uh, you know, the theme of Mark might be just do it. Just do it, okay? Um, practice it, live it. Okay, let's jump into the text. Uh, John the Baptist prepares the way, uh, chapter 1, uh, verses 1 to 8. So, the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah. Unlike Matthew, Luke, there's nothing about the birth of Christ, okay? Uh, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. Here Mark quotes Malachi and uh, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. And, and what's fascinating, the word that in the New International is translated calling, the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Um, having had several years of Greek and Hebrew, I, I, I have some Greek dictionaries at home, and I thought, you know, <clears throat> I've seen that word calling translated in other ways. And there are several translations, and actually, it probably would be a more accurate translation to say the voice of one shouting in the wilderness. Now, here you're in the lowest part of the world, and uh, you're kind of in the desert, and uh, so you're just not going to have nice chats. The voice of one shouting in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord. The word that's used here has intensity. It has power. It has emotion. In other words, people could tell that John, uh, that John Mark, that Mark felt what he was sharing. He wasn't just saying good stuff. Verse 4, and so did John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him 
confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. Let me give you a short context. People were pumped by John's presence and John's preaching. Okay? And John the Baptist was really weird. He was kind of like the first century hippie. Okay? Um, and there had not been a prophet for over 300 years. So for hundreds of years, they'd been waiting for a prophet, and here this weird guy appears of all places in the desert, not in Jerusalem, not in the temple, but in the desert between where the Jordan River empties into the Dead Sea. And uh, people came from Jerusalem to where they were baptized back a 42-mile round trip. Now, if you've ever been to Jerusalem and driven down to the Dead Sea, you know you're going down and down, and you drive up and up. To watch that would not be easy. It wasn't a nice stroll. Hey, you know, this weekend, let's just kind of walk down to the Dead Sea. You know, anyone who does that probably wasn't very sharp, <laughs> okay? But, and, and those who came from other places in Judea, they came more than 42 miles. They come round trip, down to a place that not, is not that beautiful, and why did they come? To confess their sins. You know, I want to go down and meet this guy I've heard about, and I want to own my stuff. I want to own my stuff. To confess their sins, to repent, and be baptized. And again, Repent doesn't mean I'm walking along and I go, oh, bummer. Oh, that wasn't too good. I, I think I'll go a bit the different direction. No, well, may, maybe I'll go, you know, no. Repent means I do a 180. I'm walking this way, and when I repent, I walk the opposite direction. That's what it means to repent. It's not bummer. It's not oops. It's not just I feel bad. Okay, I want to go a different direction with my life. Wow. Repent and be baptized. John came to prepare the hearts of men and women for the coming of the Messiah. And the baptism led to their repentance. So again, repentance is not just bummer. It's not just oops. It's not just I'm sorry. Real repentance is doing a 180. And there may be some things in your life that you need to repent from. Now and again, there are things in my life where I realize that I need to do a one easy and go a healthier, a more mature, a more responsible direction. John 6. And again, and this is fascinating. We have 15 verses. John covers this and what takes other guys four chapters, and yet... It's important to mention this. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild hunting. There's no description of what Christ wore found anywhere in the four Gospels. And yet, somehow, Mark wants to let us know that John the Baptist came in the form of and... Uh, in some ways, in response to the teaching of Elijah as a prophet. Elijah wore camel's hair. He wore clothes, a leather belt. And uh, like Elijah, John the Baptist lived in the wilderness. And it was not about drawing attention to himself. I'm a great teacher. I'm the cousin of Jesus. I'm here to prepare the way. No, it was never about John the Baptist and how important he was. His job was to live and model and prepare a way for Christ. I love that. Verse 7, and this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and, and, and untie. And, and again, verse 7, <clears throat> you, you read that. I read that many times, and it kind of meant no big deal. But back in the first century, Okay, when you were wealthy, you would come home and your slave or servant would take your sandals off. 
You didn't have to bend down and untie their sandals. That was something a slave or a servant would do. And John the Baptist says, I am not even worthy. I'm not good enough to bend down and take his sandals. So this is how he's trying to help prepare folks for who, who is coming. Wow. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And, and uh, baptize means to immerse. No tipping, you know, no, put your toe in, all in, or you're not in at all, okay? All of who we are, or, you know, it's, it's not just kind of, a, 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 again, a, a toe dipping. I immerse you in water, but she was immerse you with the Holy Spirit. And in Acts 2, at Pentecost, believers were immersed in the Holy Spirit. And now when we ask Christ into our heart, okay, uh, the Father comes and we'll read later how Christ said, I need to go so the Holy Spirit can come. And while the Father, Son, Holy Spirit is in us and with us, the Holy Spirit is with us in some unique ways that we'll be seeing in the next couple of months. Gosh, this is good stuff. Is this making any sense so far? Are you getting a wee bit of idea of how unique this gospel is? Wow. Okay. Uh, the baptism and testing of Jesus. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John the Jordan. Now, John the Baptist and Jesus were cousins. They knew each other. They, they were friends, okay? But we don't have any conversation with John the Baptist and Jesus. Jesus came down from Nazareth. It comes down 100 miles from the north. It comes to where the Jordan River empties into the Dead Sea, 1,400 feet below sea level, the lowest place in the earth. Mark doesn't mention any conversation that Jesus and his cousin, John the Baptist, had. And here's John the Baptist, who of the billions of people who have lived and died, there was one guy who was picked to announce God the Son. God becomes man so he can die and rise again for us. And one man is picked to acknowledge him, to recognize him, to baptize him, to begin the three-year ministry. So guys, that kind of shows how unique and special John the Baptist was. God picked him to baptize God the Son in the form of human flesh to begin the ministry that led to your salvation and my salvation. Wow. Just as Jesus was come up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn apart and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. <clears throat> and the voice from heaven, you are my Son, whom I love. With you, I'm well pleased. Wow. You are my son whom I love. With you, I'm well pleased. Some of you have done some great stuff. You've taught Sunday school classes. Maybe you've written some things. Uh, maybe you've sung in choirs, whatever. And God's allowed me to spend a, 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 a lifetime, most of my lifetime, doing things and serving, writing, teaching, speaking. But you know what? When I get to heaven, all, I, all I'm going to need to hear is, well done, that good and faithful servant. Well done. I, I'm not going to need any recognition, any acknowledgement. Well done, that good and faithful leader. Uh -uh. Well done, that good and faithful author. No. Well done, that good and faithful uh, 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 teacher. No. Well done, that good and faithful servant. And a servant is one who serves. With a servant, it's not about him or her. It's about who we're called to serve. And that's why this is so important. You are my son whom I love, with you I'm more pleased. 
So God the Son comes out of the water. The voice of God the Father gives his confirmation. And God the Holy Spirit descends on him like a dove. Wow. Uh, uh, the dove stands for gentleness and tenderness. So we have three verses, the baptism of Christ. This is Mark. Now verse 12, at once the Spirit sent him out to the wilderness. He was there for 40 days, tempted by Satan, was with the wild animals, and the angels directed him. Tempted for 40 days, and the angels uh, attended him. Moses was on Mount Sinai for 40 days. Uh, Elijah stripped to Mount Horeb for 40 days, and Christ in the wilderness. Here's the deal, though, my friends. Temptation isn't the sin. And, and, and I just think that for me. Boy, I, I have a thought in, in my mind. I, I, I grew up at the beach in Southern California. I spent thousands of hours at the beach, okay? Um, and yes, I, I used to actually surf, uh, okay? And, um, but temptation isn't the sin. Having a thought enter your mind isn't the sin. Focusing and dwelling and visualizing that's when it can become the sin and lead us down an unhealthy pathway. Well, the last two verses. So we have three verses for the baptism, two verses for the temptation. Last two verses, 14 and 15, Jesus announces the good news. After John's put in prison, Jesus went to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. And as I thought about, you know, in some ways, this is not one of the most exciting passages I've taught. Okay? Uh, I mean, I'm not putting it down, but really, I mean, yippee kaye, it's not that. Okay? And uh, I, I can see why they gave it to me. Uh, and... Uh, <clears throat> Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness being tempted. Here's the deal, my friends. We all have our own wilderness. We all have our own temptations. And some of you are, have been, will be in a kind of wilderness. Today we have the wilderness of increased uncertainty. The upcoming elections, Russia, Ukraine, Israel, and Arabs, Biden followers and Trump worshipers. Um, you know, we have all this political stuff, and will the Razorbacks ever have a good football team? I mean, those are real concerns that many, you know, have. Increased uncertainty. And you know, we're also in a wilderness today of increased insecurity. We can't help but feel threatened, feel vulnerable. Our how we feel, uh, how much money we have, our health, our weight, how our job's going. And many people self-medicate. We play games, we distract ourselves. The average American spends over 13 hours a day looking at some screen, over 13 hours a day. And maybe 10 minutes a day reading the Bible and having prayer. Obviously that's not important. That's not valuable. But keeping up on things, that's important. And, and by the way, I, I do the strange thing too, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not criticizing anybody. I'm, okay? But that's just a fact. And as a psychologist, I can tell you that increased uncertainty and things that kind of all we're looking at and filling our ideas with news can actually lead to more depression, more worry, more anxiety. I've never had one client who I had to say, you know, here's your homework. Go home and watch more news because you'll be less depressed and you won't be as anxious and you won't be nearly as afraid. Man, you think you're having problems. The world is jacked. <laughs> Just watch the news and you'll find out how lucky you know. Okay? That's, that's not how it works. Um... Depression, worry, fear, we all have it. We spend more time discussing, debating, 
And boy, I, I took time to write this paragraph. It's not very long. Discussing, debating, and devising over sexism, racism, ageism, politics, then investing our time. I can't count how much of my time I've spent rather than invested. Investing our time in reminding of sell, ourselves of and focusing on whose we are. We're his beloved. And even when I do stupid stuff, he loves me. He can't leave you. He can't forsake you. He can't not be faithful because he's promised. Who we are designed to be and become. We're designed to be daughters and sons, women and men who live and look and listen and love and sound a wee bit more like him. Hmm. What he has promised. Boy, I, I, I found over the decades that the more time I spend being aware of his promises, the more of a difference that makes in my life. And how we can grow, whose we are, who's designed us to be and become, what he has promised, and how we can grow. And, and of course, the wilderness experiences set us up for temptation. Hmm? Have you had any temptations this week? Have you been distracted? Have your minds wandered? Have you had things cause your mind that cause your eyes to look and begin to imagine? Have you felt anyone has been critical of you and, and, and wanted to say, or maybe you've said something nasty to somebody or been unkind? Okay. Now, if you haven't, don't worry about it. The person on your left or your right has. Okay. So someone in your row has acts. I know, it's embarrassing. Um, this past week, I've had mostly small temptations, but I have them. And I'm still capable of doing stupid and immature stuff. Not nearly like I used to, because we're human. And the occupational hazard of being human is that we're vulnerable. <clears throat> temptations often start with distractions, but noticing is never the problem. We can choose to focus and dwell on, and what we do will impact and eventually determine a lot of things. We can choose to focus on ways that we can grow in becoming men and women who over time are living and looking and listening and loving and sounding a wee bit more like our Lord Jesus Christ every day. But guys, we can be so easily distracted. So don't feel bad if you are, you're normal. And Satan is the master of distractions. So on your way home tonight, what might you be distracted by? Probably not necessarily sin. But, uh, and as you go through your week, what are some things that might distract you from what's most important to you? What distractions are you the most vulnerable to? Christ kept his mind and heart focused on the Father, listening for his voice, doing his will, being faithful in the Lord. Well, as you know, I, I end all my teachings with three words, okay? Uh, so now what? Fifteen verses. Again, not a lot of depth. I, I'm not putting Mark down. <clears throat> But, uh, yeah, so now what? This week, what simple practices might help reflect the fact that you and I really do believe the good news? Colossians 3, 2 kind of gives us a response. Don't shuffle it along, eyes to the ground, absorbed with things right in front of you. Look up and be alert to what is going on around Christ. That's where the action is. See things from his perspective. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? I just want to take about a minute or two, really. <clears throat> Guys, for most people, how we start our day enormously impacts how we live our day. So for the next five days, what might it look like for you to invest a wee bit of time 
every morning, setting your mind on things above, focusing on him. For example, I've shared this before, other leaders have too. I, I started every day with about a nine minute uh, kind of podcast thing, like the 0365. It really helps my wandering mind to focus. And I read the Psalm. You might decide to read the Psalm every morning. I've read a psalm every morning for decades, sometimes more than one. But it's not how much you read. It's as you read it, do you think about it? Do you kind of let it settle with you? So maybe just take five minutes in the morning, 10 minutes, let those 365, read the psalm. Maybe pray the Jesus prayer. Pray the Jesus prayer I've shared many times. How about pausing to give thanks? How about counting your blessings? When's the last time that you've spent even a minute thanking God for things? Thanking God that you can walk, that you've had food today. Thanking God for things that we take for granted. You've heard me say before, I never thank God for my tongue until I lost it. Okay? So are there some things that are really important that you haven't thanked God for? Giving him thanks. Count your blessings. And then maybe at the end of that 10 minutes, Lord, today, who might I be patient with? Who might I be kind with? Is there someone that I might forgive? Might I be a better listener today? Is there someone that I can encourage? Lord, how can I not just be a hearer or a reader, but a doer? And that's what the Gospel of Mark is about, as i have seen in the months ahead. Mark was a doer. Mark just didn't have a lot of good things to say. But Mark really encourages us to practice. And again, he or she who is faithful in little is faithful also much. God, thank you for the amazing family we have here at Mosaic. Thank you for the leadership, and thank you for the opportunity to come and gather. And Lord, thank you for the sacred, the sacred time we are about to share together. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.